Well, I'm extremely pleased to have with us on the show today, Venerable Pandit, who is a Buddhist monk here in Bangkok. And we've received many requests to do a show about Buddhism. And so we've decided to come down to, what is this place called? This is the Arya Som Hotel. Good Lord. These things. Arya Som Villa. Arya Som. Som Villa Boutique Hotel on uh, Sukhumit Soi Wan. Soi Wan to uh, do a show about Buddhism. Yeah. Welcome. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. Now, an interesting thing about yourself is that you are not Thai. Uh huh. Can you tell our audience a little bit about your history, about how you came to Thailand, and what made you decide to become a monk? Yeah. Um, originally, I, w I wanted to become a monk because I didn't really like people, and I didn't like working, and I didn't <laughs> like the world. <laughs> and his son, I read a great book about a monk who lived in a cave. And his best friend was a snake who lived under his bed. And uh, he just meditated and had nothing to do with the world. I thought, that's great. That's me. And of course, it doesn't work out that way uh, when you do it, really, because you're, you're thrown into a temple with a lot of people and you're living in close quarters with uh, other monks and abbots and everybody else. So it's actually a very intense social situation um, to be a monk. But that was the original uh, impetus, and then I did various meditation retreats and stayed in the temple a bit longer and a bit longer. And then, uh, next thing, I have no more hair, and I'm a monk. How long have you been in Thailand as a monk? 14 years now. That's really interesting that, you, that it started as sort of a rejection of society. But I mean, with a, probably most lay people would think that a monk gets into it because of they want to they want to connect with people they want to connect with god they want to get involved with charity and help people but you sort of had the the opposite effect i mean you just kind of wanted to get away from it all yeah coming from england the the christian traditions you have two main traditions one is a monastic tradition where the monks will cut themselves off from society they'll very very rarely leave the temple uh, and they'll live and work in the in the monastery the whole life and then you have a second line, which is the vicars, uh, or the people who run the churches and the parishes, and they're very connected in the society. Buddhism doesn't have these two traditions. It has, just has one that lies in between. So your monks are kind of halfway in between. Uh, on the one hand, we're enunciate recluses, but on the other hand, the way the monastery is set up, you have to have contact with people to get your alms food in the morning, to run the temples for the villages. So you're kind of in between these two roles of a recluse and a renunciate on the one side, but being involved in society on the other. What's, what's the procedure for someone who's looking to become a monk? When you came from England, is there a school or, or how does that work? Yes, you have to be um, clear what you want and then you find the temple and you ask the abbot and then you do what he tells you. <laughs> 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 Usually there's um, something like a three-month wait where they will check check you and make sure you're ordaining for the right reasons. Some temples actually make you wait two years, up to two years before you can ordain. I know one monk who was made to wait nine years before he was given ordination. Wow. And what do you do? They just say, come back in nine years, or do you have to go no, on a training program? You'd stay in the temple and, and live there and work there and oh, uh, I see. Okay. be in the community. Yeah. Okay. Back in England, were you? did you consider yourself a spiritual person? I've never really th thought of myself as a spiritual person. I guess it sounds funny to say that. Um, I guess the, with the meditation, it's an inward training. So as you start to look at your own mind, you start to go further and further inwards. So you start to let go of these ideas of being spiritual or being a teacher or being anything at all. And you're looking in, inside yourself deeper and deeper. And then it's the people on the outside put labels on you then, which feels kind of strange, actually. Um, so there's a lot of projections onto the robes. You know, people think, you know, monks should behave like this, they should behave like that. Actually, you're just the same as you were, just normal people. And if you ever go into the temples and you get together with the monks, you see, actually, they're very ordinary. They still watch TV, they still joke around, they still do everything that other ordinary people do. But we have a framework of a, a moral code that we live to uh, on the top of it. 
That's it. That was my experience because I, the first time I met you was about two years ago when I interviewed you for yeah. an article I was writing. And um, I, I, I still would call myself an idiot when it comes to knowing about Buddhism traditions <laughs> and, the, and the history and the, what's involved. But back then I was even stupider. I didn't know anything. And what really surprised me was the fact that you have a blog. And <laughs> those funny. two thoughts to the average person, I think, maybe I'm, I'm just sort of representative of the dumb half, but for the average person, I think, is, is a wild contradiction in, in sort of what's expected and the labels that are put on, on these people. And I think because monks and Buddhism have such a sort of mystical association for Western minds, they don't think like, oh, here's a monk with a blog. Right. And you always hear people freaked out walking around Pantip and they see monks shopping for a computer or a phone or something right. like that. Where else would you get your computer? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. Like the, the local corner shop doesn't sell them. You, know? you have to go to Pantip. <laughs> but I think many people, are, they wonder, why does a monk need a computer? I think they're under the assumption that if you're in the temple and your, your whole belongings are just that, I, I think they, they assume that you're, you're rejection of anything modern and but that, is, that, is that not true? No, uh, and there's a lot of emphasis these days on monks who ordain uh, is on education. So they're expected to go through up to nine years of, of Pali and Dhamma education in the temple. But also like a, a very large percentage of monks are going and get university degrees. And so you need the equipment to do that. You need to know how to type, how to use a computer. And the idea is that if monks are going to be leaders in society, they should have an education that's equal to the people in the society, rather than being someone who's never seen or heard or doesn't know anything about mathematics or history or English. How are they then going to be a good teacher for the lay people? So the modern movement is that monks should, in fact, get a good education and be able to use and do all the things that lay people do. Just sort of fit into modern society and, and use right. those tools to, to sort of put the emphasis on the, on the leadership and the spiritual side of things. Yeah. When you first came to Thailand, was there any um, reaction or, or resistance from the Thais to have a Falang monk? Uh, there's no resistance. Uh, the Thais are very proud. They're very happy for you to become a monk. And they really like the, to see the Western monks. The bigger problem is on the other way, that everywhere I walk, I get crowds of people, you know, looking and pointing and little kids jumping up and down shouting there's a Prat Farang, there's a Prat Farang, <laughs> and calling their parents out and things like that and you could feel like very conspicuous so much so you sometimes you don't want to to go out and walk down the street so it's kind of ironic then that your original intention was to get away from society and you've come here and you've become almost a mini celebrity and right, you're and attracting more attention yeah and everybody's uh, looking at you and I know when I was a kid, if I saw a like a black vicar, I wouldn't leap up and down and shout to my parents, you know, as a black vicar or a Chinese nun. You know, I, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that. But in Thailand, yes, you you attract a lot of attention. So how how long did you uh, did you prepare for your ordination exams? And um, oh, you don't take exams; you just have to rem memorize the chanting. And, and that's all in Pali, right? That's all in Pali. Memorize the chanting and the choreography. But you can do that if you've done any memorization before. It takes, you know, just a few days. You really? can actually uh, memorize the uh, ordination procedure. But it's different when you're there on the day and there's all the people around you and uh, it gets quite nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what does, uh, what's your relationship like with your family back in, back in London? Uh, they don't like it. They, um, I guess the baby boomer generation had this idea that you, that the world being at peace for the first time, that you should work hard, get a good job and a career and buy a house. And so then that's what they expected. And so to have no money and to have no home is the antithesis of, of everything they work for in their life. So they weren't so keen on the idea. That's, that's really interesting because one of the things that my, me and my friends and sort of other expats I talk to discuss a lot is the Western mindset where you have to have a car and a mortgage and a family by the time you're 35. Um, otherwise, you're sort of seen as like, well, you're not really fitting into this culture. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that personally that I enjoy about living in Bangkok is you're not really expected to fit into that. And there's sort of a wider range of, of expectations for people. But um, 
but you've taken it a step further and just really sort of gone into the this sort of rejected the whole idea of western possessions and and things like that i think it's a movement in in western consciousness or culture now that because we've been brought up in a safe society whereas people in my parents generation were brought up you know at the tail end of the war and um, so they really did have to plan and work and build we're kind of mollycoddled that we expect to have a health service we expect to to have safety on the roads we expect not to be hit by floods and fires and tanks and guns and things so i think we're the younger generation uh by which i mean under 40 <laughs> uh you know we're a lot more confident that the world's going to provide for us than any other generations before us right right or well, confident i i think even if you go even further down the generation expect it i yes, think yeah. you know, the 20 some odds are really uh expectant of the world to provide for them and i i think that they're less likely to work for it than their grandfathers might have uh that's a dangerous trend that i think is happening in in, in the states i don't know about the rest of the world but uh, i definitely see that happening in the states um can I ask you uh what what influence does buddhism have in in thai society and thai culture Yeah, people often criticize Thai culture. They say you're supposed to be Buddhist, but there's all this corruption and there's all this prostitution and there's all this sense desire in shopping malls. So it can seem a bit of a contradiction, but my experience is the Thais are, are really quite deeply spiritual people. And um, there's a lot of understanding in the in the society about uh, meditation, about religion, about morality. and much more so than you'd ever have come across in England uh, or in, or anywhere else that I've been for example even you know as a monk you'd think that you know, we are always giving teachings and telling people things actually as a monk most people tell you things they give you their opinions and even in taxes taxes will ask a little question how long have you been ordained and then they'll suddenly start piling onto you all their views and opinions buddhism should be like this and suffering is like that and they have all these views whereas i wouldn't have found that anywhere else so i think there's a very deep appreciation and an understanding of buddhism and but religion as a whole within the thai society and of course i see a lot more of it in the temples that a lot of people come to do meditations on the uh, national holidays they come for three days or five days In my own temple there's about 100 people every day every morning and every evening come for the meditation so i think there's a very big general awareness of the spiritual values and can you tell us you know i'll i'll be the ignorant guy here i don't know anything about buddhism but what is the the goal or or the object of of meditation i've tried it and what i honestly within a couple of minutes my mind is thinking about something else the thought of doing it for a couple of hours i i I'd probably fall asleep but what is the purpose of it why do people come and do it so if your mind is somewhere else after a couple of minutes who's in control of your mind who do you question answer that one tony joe yeah i got to think about that i mean <clears throat> you know you say is that, that a trick question i'm setting up my you think i'm setting up my retirement i'm setting up my business i'm a good father or a good husband or a good son But if you're not in control of the mind that makes nonsense of all those notions right. that you carry right. around. Right. So this is what's the interesting part about it. First of all, you start to really learn about yourself. And things change when you're willing to look, when you're willing to look into your own mind. You see you're not the kind of person that you thought you were. You see that the body and the mind don't work the way that you thought they worked. Then ultimately after a while you start to get these little breaks and little bright moments where the mind just comes together. Uh, it's called the unification of the mind and when you see and taste that and touch that you start to see how oh, this is you know real wholesomeness this is real happiness as opposed to chasing after new cars and watches and and sounds and things so then this then gives you a second mo- motivation because you start to see uh, a different way of being and then ultimately you attain to enlightenment which is the ending of suffering uh, the supernatural enlightenment mm. well, what's the um what 
Like, can you walk me through the procedure on that? Like when I when I looked into your your class there, and I just I just see everyone just sitting there, not saying anything, eyes closed. Right. How does that clear your mind? Are they, are they saying something in their in their to themselves, or is there something in the air, or how, how does well, that there's work? different methods of meditating. Uh, one way is to use a meditation object and concentrate on it very hard. So you can use a short mantra, uh, or you can use light or you can use the breathing and really concentrate the mind hard on it and then as you relax the concentration you see that the mind has gone very quiet and very peaceful because you pushed everything out the second way of meditating and these two ways are not actually opposed to each other is to really focus on the mind and take a look so if the mind is really busy thinking you look at that and you interrupt the process as human beings, what you like to do is to go into the unconscious. You like to lapse into some strain of thought, uh, some line of thinking, and turn off. And you can actually be in this line of thinking for hours and hours uh, with very little self-awareness. With meditation, you're trying to interrupt this tendency of the mind to continually go towards some unconscious habitual activity. So when Tony is trying to meditate and he was thinking about, you know, his email or what he's doing today or something, you're saying that what he should do what he should be doing is concentrating on why he's thinking that and the underlying reason behind that? Right, you interrupt the process. So if you sit and you say watch the breathing and then you you realize that for 10 minutes you've been lost in thought about something. How come it is that you can be lost in thought about it and completely forget about your whole intention? The point is that you're not aware of what your mind is doing most of the time. So with the meditation, you're trying to train yourself up in that awareness. So you do know what the body and the mind is doing the whole time. So you don't have to think about it, you just have to keep being aware. You catch the mind slipping away into some strain of thought or some strain of activity, getting dull, getting agitated, uh, getting doubtful, getting caught up in some desire. And you catch it and you bring your awareness back. As you keep doing this over and over again, then your mind gets sharper and sharper. And after a while, you can even see the gaps in between the thoughts. And in between thoughts, it's very peaceful, it's very beautiful. The mind comes together, it gets brighter, it gets stronger, it gets happier. Hmm, interesting. So, in some ways, meditation could be used by type A personalities, business people, to sure. focus their attention on what they need to do. Whereas, whereas I think in the West, the common misconception is that meditation is for the hippies and Right. <laughs> well, that's what I think. You know, but, but I mean, uh, I remember reading uh, that um, Carl Jung's book about meditation in business, and I was, and he kind of said something similar. I was, I kind of thought, wow, you know, if you could really focus your mind, um, it would help you in all aspects of your life. Sure. Um, and whatever it is that you do, if you can clear your mind before you do it, you'll you'll do that thing a lot better. Right. And it's good for taking exams and uh, writing books and things like that. Uh, it's very big in the business world these days. It's it's definitely broken outside of its original hippie culture, right. kind of Beatles perception. And actually mindfulness meditation, which is the primary Buddhist way of meditating, uh, has been taken out of its original Buddhist context now. And you can, if you just Google up mindfulness plus research, you see all this endless research that's being done into mindfulness that is People are trained to do mindfulness meditation completely outside of Buddhism and then uh, measured for heart rate, measured for cortisol, the stress hormones, measured for uh, the latest one was gene expression is supposed to change when you do mindfulness, measured for your response to pain and things like this. One program is called the MBSR, mm -hmm. Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. Uh, if you just Google up MBSR, they've been running these tests for, for like 30 years now. So it's proven. It has direct, immediate physical effects on the body if you do this kind of meditation. What are your thoughts about people uh, or, or a new movement taking meditation out of Buddhism? They're yeah, just... that's a good... There's a lot of resistance um, because you're losing the goal of enlightenment and you're exchanging it with a goal of therapy. And the psychological traditions are only interested in using it for therapy. Taking a person however they are and making them a little bit happier than they've done their job. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a bit, con a bit of a conflict though? I mean, say meditating before a business meeting in order to 
sign that big contract, which is going to result in a million dollar bonus. I mean, that kind of is a bit of a conflict, isn't it? But sure, why not? Yeah. There's two, two, two things I think are beneficial. One, I think Buddhist techniques or meditation techniques are very beneficial for the psychological tradition. So psychology has a lot to learn from Buddhism. And I think it should learn it, and that's good. And they can take whatever tools they want, whatever teachings they want, and apply it in a direct way. Uh, and most importantly, apply proper research to it, proper peer-reviewed research. Uh, I think this has got to be a good thing, both for Buddhism and for psychology. The other thing is that there's also a feedback mechanism that psychology has influenced a lot of Buddhism also. And I think Buddhism has a lot to learn from psychology. I can give you one example. Monks are not trained to be counselors. They have no idea how to talk to people, and yet that's one of the jobs in the temples. So I, I, I've been really interested in, in bringing in some basic counseling techniques and trying to get the monks to learn them. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a very good feedback mechanism there. I think both can benefit. When uh, students come to your temple for the first time, generally, what is their attitude? What are they looking for? Well, my temple is a Thai temple. It's not You don't really get any Westerners there. And it's a little bit out of the way. It's a very famous Thai temple. So mostly people come because the former abbot was very famous. Which one is it? Uh, it's called Lumpur Sot. Uh, this is Wat Paknam temple. Oh, okay. Um, what about the farang? I saw a lot of farang in your class. What, what, are these, what are they generally looking for? Okay, with our own group, uh, I tend to do things in Bangkok. It's separate to the temple. And people come for all kinds of different reasons. Some people are sick, ill, or have cancer, have AIDS. Some people are just unhappy. Uh, some people just like the idea of meditation. It's, it's in all the magazines these days. It's in newspapers. So people like to come and try it. Especially while people are abroad, I think they're minds are a little bit more open and they're more willing to try something new uh, so a whole range of different reasons can people meditate at home can they learn it from a book or a dvd sure. program yeah why not it's hard to keep going on your own now <laughs> you, you need a, a group around you it's like anything really i mean like me learning thai you know if i try to do it on my own it's just a right. train wreck but yes if I go to class, it's still a train wreck, but at least I'm... <laughs> I thought at least it got further down wreck. the line before it got wrecked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, um, can you describe your typical day as a monk? Oh, it changes a lot. Uh, I work a lot in the university, in the monks' university. We have our own uh, university up towards the UTR. And then I have the... The groups, we organize Dhamma talks and meditations some of the days. Some of the days I'm in my temple doing the temple activities. Uh, some days I get to go off. It just varies a lot. Hugely, hugely, huge variety in the life, actually. But um, generally speaking, you wake up very, very early. You don't eat afternoon. Yeah, that's one of the misconceptions. Is it really? You have a, Set me straight. What, what's, uh, what's the misconception? I don't always get up that early. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, that that's a pretty relative term. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, you tend to, okay, get up a bit earlier. and diff It just depends. Different people have different jobs. One of the things is you can't stay in a temple and do nothing. And while you don't have to do anything in a temple, you know, even after a few years, everybody has to have something to do. So then people start to contribute in their own ways. Some of the monks will look after the cleaning up. Some of them will look after the building. Some will look after teaching. Some will look after the administration. Some will, will be ardent meditators. So you have a huge variety. It's just like lay life. You have a huge variety of roles that you can get involved with. Yeah. Is, is there any significance to the color of the robes? No. No? Did someone just like orange one day and... Yes. Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the question. <Yeah. laughs> the, actually, it was, originally, it was, there were supposed to be rag robes that you bleach, and then you, you dye with uh, a dye made from the jackfruit tree. But depending on how you make the dye and which part of the tree it comes from, it can be anywhere from a dark brown to a dark red to uh, orange to yellow. And... 
So it just depended how, on how people made the dye. And then these days, of course, we buy the robes. And most temples will have their own kind of color. Um, but some temples don't. They can, you can go in in any color. And they can change color. It doesn't make any difference. But the bright orange has the distinct advantage that it's very safe if you're walking down the road at night. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a constant construction, construction like a worker safety vest. Construction vest. cone. Hey, that construction cone is walking. <laughs> right, and skiing. It's good for skiing. <laughs> you ski with that? <laughs> I would like to get a picture of that. A monk skiing down a hill. That would be awesome. Um, a monk skiing up a hill would be even more awesome. <laughs> <than that. laughs> <laughs> Without any actual skis, just floating above the snow. Zing. Um, there have been some uh, discussion among some of the blogs that I read about the so-called fake monks that you see on okay. the streets of Bangkok. Um, yeah. uh, I know a well-known blogger here who speaks pretty decent Thai. He uh, usually goes out of his way to try to see if they speak Thai, and he says many times they don't. They, they speak Chinese. What are your thoughts on these so-called fake monks? Are they, are they really fake? Usually they're asking for change is that are you allowed to do that right there's a, there's actually a saying in thailand that there's no such thing as a fake monk there's only fake people and the idea being that the monkhood itself is uh, something pure and something respectable the person wearing the robes may not be respectable may not be acting in the right way so the, that's actually quite a, a mature view on the thai's part that they, they separate the, the individual from the role. So they still can respect and venerate the role, even if the person filling the robes isn't uh, behaving properly. And sometimes I get also people wag their fingers at me and, and tell me what I should and shouldn't do. But they're telling the individual rather than the monk. And the same when people bow to monks, they're never bowing to the individual, you're bowing to the robes, to the status, and never to the actual individual who's wearing the robes. So the Thais have a very good understanding of that, which is why they're quite tolerant in many respects. And so they don't consider them as fake monks. They might consider them as bad people or people who are not living up to the right standard of the monkhood. And there are some, of course, and maybe they ask, you know, that, that you've seen them on TV and whatnot, but I think it's relatively minor. A few years ago, there was a monk who was caught in the evening, you'd put on a hat and a jacket and he'd go sing karaoke. And he was exposed, he was caught, and they had this big expose on him. I think that's a sign of how healthy Buddhism is in Thailand, that a controversy is a monk who went to sing karaoke. <laughs> right? With all these horrible scandals that we've seen in, in, in Canada and other churches and you know, that you've seen from pedophile rings and Nazi collaborators and things. I think Thailand, Thai Buddhism is in very good condition. But there have been some more serious infractions. I mean, there was that famous picture of a monk holding an M16 machine gun. Uh, this was years ago. Um, right, in Sri Lanka. Monks with girlfriends and wives and things like that. This is in Thailand, I, I think. I mean, okay. certainly not common. It, but it's, it has been known. I, I've never known any monks actually firing guns on the front line. But in general, I mean, I, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen in my temple, um, you know, somebody taking drugs. And when it becomes apparent, you know, the, the abbot says, right, you know, you're obviously not suited for this. And then they're disrobed. And so I think things are handled in a very mature, sensible way. There's an expectation, especially amongst foreigners, of like monks are supposed to be devas, you know, supposed to be wonderfully pure. But there's within the monastic society, we know that that's not the case. We're, just, we're regular people and you've got greed, you've got hatred, you've got desires, you've got problems. And so I, I think there's a good awareness of that and there's a willingness to work with that rather than simply pointing blame. Interesting. Can we can we talk about that for, for, for a little bit? Sure. You are, you're, one of your rules is you're not allowed to marry or have relations with women? Yeah. And you just mentioned the word desires. How do you overcome that? You don't overcome desire. You, you understand desire. But, you know, this is, really isn't anything that complicated. If you get married, you're also going to have desires for other men or other women, right? So how do you overcome that and stay loyal to your wife? Okay, some people don't, but, you know, most people do. And most people see the benefit of that. 
and so that's the reward. So I, I don't think you over, you really overcome it. I don't see it's really any different to to lay life in that respect. Do you package uh, desire in that sense to uh, something like a desire for a new computer or a desire for a new house? Or is it all kind of wrapped up together as just desire? You mean, you re- <laughs> so you mean you get vicarious pleasures by redirecting your desire onto other things? <laughs> uh, not really. I don't think it's anything too complicated. Um, if you appreciate the monkhood and you like the life, then it's not much of a sacrifice. If you, if you really are torn up by desires, then usually people will disrobe and then they'll go and live that kind of life. Now, most Thai men are expected to uh, or, um, study as a monk for several months at some point during their life. Yeah, I think that's, that's been whittled down to several days now. Though. Really? It gets shorter and shorter as years go by. What, what percentage of, of people who try it would you say that sort of stick with it and it ends up turning into a lifestyle, a choice that they follow? Oh, not too many in that sense. But there's more like novices, like uh, young kids who are put into the temple for various reasons. Their parents uh, have died or they're drug addicts uh, or they have a particularly wayward child and they want to just try and straighten them out. Sometimes they want their kids to ordain so they can get an education. So for whatever reason, a lot of kids are forced into the temple and forced into robes. And out of that group, quite a lot would actually stay on and be monks for the rest of their life. One of the aims of the monks' university, actually, is to provide an escape route for the people who have been forced into the monkhood and want a way out. So then, as monks, they're able to go and get a degree, and then they disrobe and they're given one year uh, work placement somewhere in society. So they have a route out of the monkhood. It's like an honorable discharge almost. And another thing, you know, Thai families, if they have like four good sons and one not so bright, or one who gets into trouble a lot, They'll put him into the monastery, and then the family keep the good ones. <laughs> and then the Thais complain, the monks are no good, you know, but this is, this is the stuff, these are the people they're putting into the temples. Wouldn't, wouldn't they be able to say then to the bad, like, look at the, the one son, he used to be bad, now he's a monk. Right. Now he's almost like better right. than you good sons who are now just mere businessmen. Yeah, I think they just want to get their merit from having one son in the, in the monkhood, but... <laughs> Uh, not the best quality son. <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I tried to... There's a lot of people interested in Buddhism and interested in Dhamma talks and meditation, but none of the organizations in Thailand really know what to do or how to communicate it. And so I tried for a few years to, to get some of the organizations interested in doing more stuff for Westerners, and it didn't really work out. So I did it myself. A few of us sat down and we thought we'll just have our own group and we'll do our own thing. And so without any money, without any backing, without any organization, a free blog, a free online calendar, little free announcements in the newspapers, uh, I found some venues that were willing to give us a room for free. And so since then that's what we've been doing. Do you think in the future you'll move more into different types of social media? Do you look at Facebook or Twitter or any of that? We have a Facebook uh, group and a Facebook user, and Facebook's been quite good. But it seems like there's a substantial community here that sort of continue and have have enough momentum to keep it going and keep it growing. Yeah, actually we have a very wide um, group. Some people come once a week, some people come once a month, some people come once every couple of years. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I know for me, I got to go home and do some thinking now. <laughs> Time to ask the internets. Yeah, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Very nice to talk to you. Thanks again to Pra Pandit for coming on the show. I really enjoyed that. That was very, very interesting. He's a smart guy. Uh, actually, you're, uh, he is a smart guy, and uh, we will be having him come on the show a little bit more regularly starting in the new year. Yeah, I think both you and I were surprised at how... Um, I mean, maybe it sounds a bit ignorant, but you, you think if you're talking to a monk and he's maybe too sheltered or too holy or too, you know, focused on Buddhism. But I mean, we, I think we were both surprised at how worldly a pandit was and how much he knew about 
so many things. So he's, he's obviously got a lot to talk about and, and he comes at it all from a vantage point of being a monk and his sort of mental place, which is something that you and I, I think is safe to say are not, <laughs> not, not in the same there, league. Yeah. yeah. So, kinda, uh, he, he's like the Yoda. We're kind of like at the Simpsons level. Yeah. He's know? like Yoda <laughs> teaching Homer Simpson, basically. <laughs> But he's, a, he's got some incredible Move insights. Move the donut with your mind. Chomp, 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 chomp. What donut? <laughs> Don't. Um, but uh, so he's going to come on the show a little bit more regularly starting the new year. So if you have any questions about Buddhism, nuclear power, or any of other interesting topics, uh, feel free to send us an email and we'll make sure that we get those on the air. Yeah, that'll be really interesting talking to him again. 